Well, it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to this program co-sponsored by the Stanford Historical Society and Stanford Travel Study of the Alumni Association. My name is Leslie Kim, and I am both a proud board member of the Historical Society as well as a senior manager at Stanford Travel Study, where I've worked for the past 17 years. My own awareness of travel study began well before I started working here. As an undergrad who was living on campus one summer as part of my honors thesis research, I needed a job and applied for a posting for administrative help at the Slavic and Eastern European Studies Department. After a day of clerical work, the hiring manager looked at me and said I might be better suited for a job assisting an old friend of the department who needed help editing his memoirs and cataloging his library. That's when I met Wayne Vucinich. As you will hear later in this presentation, Uncle Wayne, as I and others affectionately called him, I uh, spent many years leading many travel study trips on the Danube River back in the early days of the program. And he used to regale me with tales of hosting these educational riverboat cruises with Stanford alumni. It never occurred to me at the time that I would one day be a part of this exhilarating, exciting, and exhausting program myself. Travel study has been a huge part of my personal growth and journey and has allowed me to get to know so many inspiring people, many of whom are in this room tonight. The story of travel study is one that would take far longer than the hour or so program that we have prepared today, and there are many individuals here, as well as family members re representing those who have passed who are a part of that story. Since we began offering trips in 1968, Stanford Travel Study has operated 1,983 trips in over 165 countries on all seven continents, with 73,280 travelers led by hundreds of members of our faculty. What we do hope to do here this evening is to give you just a glimpse into what for many of you is the not so well known history of where Travel Study came from and how it grew into the pioneering educational travel program that it has become today and to feature just a few of the many perspectives of the people who have participated in that story. I will introduce all of our speakers now and then each of them will come up to present. First, we have Brett Thompson, who is the current director of the Travel Study Program at the Stanford Alumni Association. He, like many who have worked at Travel Study, can count his time here in a couple of stages. After graduating with a bachelor's degree in international relations from Stanford, he spent nine years working at Travel Study from 1985 to 1994, serving as deputy director in charge of finance the last three years. He then left to work on the tour operator side of the business and even took a detour from the travel industry to manage a wholesale Italian lighting company. But the lure of travel was always in his bones and he returned as director in early 2005 of Travel Study where he has been ever since. Cynthia Lang is a seasoned fundraiser and connector who coordinates engagement activities and strategic conversations with colleagues in the Bay Area and around the world. Her dedication to Stanford runs deep. After receiving her BA in French and English literatures from here, she has served on the Stanford Associates Board of Governors, the Humanities and Sciences Council, and is currently on the Institute for Research and Social Sciences Advisory Board. Last year, Cindy joined the Black Angel Tech Fund team as National Market Captain and Special Advisor. Most recently, she was part of the Knight Hennessy Scholars inaugural class selection team. She also has a deep interest and familiarity with Brazil and promoting social enterprise work there. And in 2013, she founded Go To Girl Brazil, the umbrella organization under which all of her Brazilian ventures and interests fall. Cindy serves on the Board of Action for India, Sustainable Conservation's Advisory Board, and is an advisor to Embrace, a global enterprise that delivers low-cost solutions to improve health outcomes in developing countries. Cindy carries the distinction of having traveled on a very diverse range of travel study programs. In the eight Stanford trips that she has participated in, she has joined undergraduates on field seminars in South America, taken her kids on a family adventure in Costa Rica, snorkeled in the Seychelles on an expedition, and was on our inaugural program for the Stanford National Black Alumni Association to Cuba in 2016. Professor William Durham joined the Stanford faculty in 1977, just six years after graduating with an undergraduate degree in biological sciences from here. He is currently the Bing Professor in Human Biology Emeritus, Bass University Fellow in Undergraduate Education, co-director of the OSA Golfito Initiative, and senior fellow at the Woods Institute for the Environment, all at Stanford. His past appointments include being the former director of human biology at Stanford, former chair of the Department of Anthropological Sciences, and former Yang and Yamazaki University Fellow. Bill is an innovative teacher and administrator whose primary interests are ecology and evolution, the interactions of genetic and cultural change in human populations, 
and the challenges to conservation and community development in the tropics, especially Costa Rica, the Galapagos, and the Amazon. Bill has led over 40 travel study programs since his first trip with us in 1990, and he is one of our most dedicated faculty leaders. Under his leadership, Travel Study began offering field seminars, which combined Stanford's sophomore college program, designed to give undergraduate access to faculty on a smaller scale, and the alumni traveler experience. Today, these are still among our most popular trips. I want to thank all of our speakers for taking the time to share their stories with us. And with that, I will hand off to our first speaker and my boss, Brett Thompson. Thank you. Palm Drive, 1968. <laughs> Students taking over administrative offices. Rocks thrown through windows. Riot police on campus. In the midst of all this turmoil was this man, a very courtly gentleman <laughs> by the name of Rixford Snyder. He was the director, then dean of admissions. Um, we called him Rix, or more affectionately, Rixie. Um, Rix, after he stopped uh, working in admissions, he started working with the Alumni Association, and he worked with uh, Bob Pierce there on creating an event for alumni called the Summer Alumni College. So they did that for a couple years, and then Rix had a brilliant idea. His idea was to take the alum Summer Alumni College on the road. And this is what they produced in 1968. The Summer Alumni College on the Rhine River. This was the very first travel study program. So alumni travel is actually much older than this. There are other institutions and companies that specialize in alumni travel. But this is something different. And the different part is the study part. So Rix's concept was to make this a very intensive educational experience. So there are numerous lectures, a lot of faculty involvement. And they first announced the program, and within a month, it sold out entirely with 140 places. Um, we don't have a lot of records from that time, but we do have some um, pieces from a scrapbook that one of the participants took. Um, on the left there is Bob Tennyson. He's a Stanford alum. He's also the uh, owner, he was the owner of Bungie Travel. And Bungie Travel did all the arrangements for this very first travel study trip. They also did the arrangements for a lot of trips after that. Um, and Bob was kind enough to give us his scrapbook from that very first trip, so we have some great photos from it. But this is the very first trip. You, you'll note how our sartorial standards have perhaps declined a little bit. <laughs> I no longer require my staff to wear suits on trips, although they do look nice. Um, so this was the beginning of it. And this trip actually um, was fairly costly at the time. It was $540 per person. Um, now our prices are a little bit higher. But um, it was a huge success. As I said, it sold out immediately. I'd love to put this in because this reminds me of what it was like traveling a long time ago in the golden age. So we no longer, I mean, back when we didn't have tweets, we didn't have texts, we didn't have Facebook or email, we sent telegrams. Um, and so it's a wonderful piece of apocrypha. So in 1968, we started out with that one trip. We had another the year after, a couple more after that. And then in 1974, this gentleman, Peter Vall, took over the travel study program as really the first official director of it. Um, Peter's a remarkable man. Um, he had a great vision for what possibilities this sort of travel could provide travelers and faculty. So he was a visionary in a lot of, a lot of ways and a great mentor to me. This is how I will always remember Peter. He used to love to have faculty and tour operators, cruise lines come in and he would just pull out the maps. he say, where are we gonna go? Let's find a great place to go. Let's create the best experience we possibly can. You know, and that sort of set the tone, it set the direction that we, in the five decades since, have taken with travel study. You know, our, our program has 
three basic core values. They are innovation, education, and excellence. And so we try to, we try to fulfill those all the time. So he started out by working on it. You know, we, uh, he started with four trips, immediately took it to 10, 1975. And in 1975, he did a trip to the Hopi Navajo region, which is one of his favorite areas. He used to go on and on about the Hopi Navajo, on and on and on. Um, and on that trip, one of the passengers was Alice Coogan. So Alice was the same class, class of 65, and um, she was keeping a journal of the trip and she was an incredible writer and she wrote down everything. She did these really amazing watercolors. So he said, during the trip, he said, could I take a look at your journal? So she showed it to him and he read it and he thought, wow, she can really write. And he offered her a job on the spot. So she started working there in 1975. And so the two of them brought the program to the level at which it became renowned. So they brought it from 10 trips to 40 and built the program in an amazing way. So this is a sample of her journal um, with these amazing watercolors and her comments about all different countries. There are 80 journals that she left, which are now part of the Stanford Special Collections. There's also a wonderful article about her in the Stanford Magazine that talks about her more specifically. Um, so the two of them went on to do some amazing things. And Peter, the visionary that he was, was very keen on being first. So he thought, the world's a great big place. There's a lot of places no one has been. So let's take them there. And he was undaunted by any obstacles to do that. So Stanford Travel Study was the first group to take tourists to China in 1978. Uh, the other visitor, American visitors to China before then had been part of official delegations, but we were the first tourists and the first study group to go. Um, and this picture is from then. You'll note the impossibly blue sky and the mouse suits that everybody is wearing. I can tell you that it did not look this way when I was there a couple years ago. Um, but it was the first time that American tourists had gone, which was great. Peter also liked to push the envelope literally and figuratively, and he thought, wow, wouldn't it be great to take alumni travelers to the North Pole? So he found a Soviet nuclear-powered icebreaker, which could do exactly that. So they took a whole group, they took over the ship, they took the whole group, this is in 1992. It was the first alumni group to go to the North Pole. Now there are groups that go all the time. But this was a Stanford first. We were also the first, one of the first uh, alumni groups to go to Antarctica in 1994. We were one of the very first groups to go to Cuba in 1996. We go every single opportunity that we are allowed to. Um, it is one of our most popular destinations actually, Cuba. In 2005, we went to Libya Sometimes when you're looking at the world, there are places that open briefly and then the door slams shut. Libya is one of those places. So we are no longer going to Libya, uh, but we love to try to find new places to go. Um, this is a picture of the Danube. So Leslie alluded to this previously. The Danube was one of the stalwarts of our travel program. For approximately 16 years, we did the Danube every single year often more than once a year. We had a two-year waiting list. Each departure took 120 people. It was the most popular thing ever. It was amazing. And this is Wayne, Uncle Wayne, that we used to talk, that Leslie mentioned, who went on every single trip. Um, and he and Ricks, Rixie, would go on these trips and they would just, you know, have an incredible time. People loved it. Um, Rick said a, you know, very, old school way of thinking. He didn't want anyone who wasn't married to be sharing a cabin, so we had to make sure that the birthing charts were appropriately done, um, so <laughs> it wouldn't happen. Um, and so the Danube was one of our most popular trips. This is another innovation that we had, which is the Delta Queen. So this is a steamboat 
um, re unfortunately retired, no longer in service, because it is completely wood, 100%. And so uh, we used to charter this every year, and we would go up and down the Mississippi. We you know, traverse every navigable waterway in North America that we could with this ship. And for the staff, it was a rite of passage because we made, we worked on every single arrangement. I myself worked on this trip when I was working on trips and I hired school buses to pick up our groups to take them around because there were no tour buses where we went. We had cinnamon rolls out of someone's garage one time because apparently they were the best to be had. So it was an amazing, um, very in-depth, unique experience. These Delta Queen trips were, were just amazing and we had a huge following on them. We also have tried some innovation in our programming. So this is something that, to my knowledge, no other university alumni program does. This is a trip from the Galapagos Field Seminar. You'll hear more about this later. But the field seminars are trips where alumni and students mix and experience the destination together. So it's half students, it's half undergrads. The undergrads give presentations to the alumni. It's really an amazing way for both groups to get to know each other better. And then also we do family trips. So there are other institutions that do family trips, but ours are different. Once again, we'd like to be innovative with that. Um, our family trips have YELs, we call them Young Explorer Leaders, and those are recent Stanford alums who have worked at the Stanford Sierra Camp. And so they know all about how to take care of kids and how to make the, the experience educational. So, I'd like to move on to Cindy now for a moment. Okay, I'll keep it for you. Take track, let me hear. Hello, everybody. I am really humbled and honored to be here to celebrate Stanford's Historical Society's 50th anniversary along with the Travel Study Program's 50th anniversary. And I'm especially thrilled to share the stage with my Stanford classmate, Brett, and my, um, one of my favorite professors, longtime friend and a travel companion, Bill Durham, who's led many of the trips that I've taken. Um, as you heard from Brett, my co-speakers are doing the heavy lifting tonight. They're talking about some of the nuts but I am gonna talk about some of these trips that I've taken uh, during the past 20 years. So I started thinking about travel and my first travel experience that I remember was when I was really young traveling with my parents to Hawaii and my dad was carrying this book Hawaii on $10 a day. So I'm dating myself about what you can see. And we did everything that was recommended so that we could understand where we were, the culture there, and the importance of our place in that, in that society. Then in high school, I had the, fortune, uh, the good fortune to go to a school with a very robust uh, outdoor education program. And in that program, we took deep dives in Yosemite and Catalina and a lot of other places where we weren't fortunate enough to have professors like Bill, but we had um, local guides who were able to tell us what it was like to, um, you know, how we should be experiencing this um, environmental, these environmental programs and activities. So even when I was younger, I might have been a little bit jaded and um, not as appreciative of those experiences. But today, as I look back, I realize that they really did shape me from an early age about how I like to approach travel. And these experiences have influenced the way that I've delivered travel experiences to my own children and the way I continue to travel with my parents when, um, when we, we have our little adventure. So I know that that, um, that has been really meaningful. So this is sort of my, my life uh, at Stanford Travel Study Program. And if you look in the middle, that picture is 1997. That was my family on our very first Stanford travel trip. And um, what happened in 1997 was we had reconnected with Professor Bill Durham after many years, and he had talked about this very innovative idea to mix students and alumni on a trip. 
And this trip in particular was going to the Amazon. And my ex and I had already traveled to the Amazon, but we wanted to experience it with our children. And Bill said, well, if you can bring them to Stanford every week during um, winter quarter to take the prerequisite course, conservation biology in the Amazon, then they can go. And so that's what we did. And even though they didn't understand everything at the time, they were nine and 13. Um, so, but it was very age appropriate and because Bill brought the whole experience to life through his animated conversation, his vivid photographs and, um, and just the dynamic students who were in the room with us who, who ended up leading us on this trip as well, it, uh, it was a very meaningful and life-altering experience. So even though the notion of group travel for us with the group that we didn't select was kind of novel to us, it was too good to pass up. So um, Brett already talked about the structure of these programs, the fact that you, know, you mix students and alumni and you kind of see what happens. Um, we got to know our, our student leaders very well. We have this lifelong deep relationship with Bill um, and um, the travel companions are a group of self-selected um, interested and interesting travelers. So I can see in this room, there are people that I've traveled with to um, the Great Barrier Reef, to the Gal Galapagos, and, and some of our travel leaders are in, in here as well. So I'm, I'm really thrilled that travel still continues to be an interest to so many of us in this room. Um, a little bit about the structure of these field seminars. Again, the Amazon trip is the one I'm talking about in particular, but the Galapagos also was the same. We had a student leader who was assigned to our, our intimate group of about eight people. They were with us every day on our adventures. And then um, we would, they would lead a, a lecture before dinner, maybe three, three lectures right before dinner, where they would talk about either what we had seen that day or what we were going to see the next day so we could really understand the importance and the significance of what we saw um, that day. For me, what was so important about this trip in particular, the 1997 trip to the Amazon, was that it was our first trip like this. And it was so unique for so many reasons that our family benefited in really, really great ways. Um, so there was an independent um, age-appropriate study that, the, uh, that Bill's postdoc led my children on. So they were doing... Um, their own research to take back to school because we had pulled them out of school. So they had this you know, Stanford doctoral candidate overseeing their work. And then, um, and this person is a lifelong friend 20 years later. She helped my uh, older son with his college applications and she helped my younger one with his uh, doctoral program work in fellowship um, seeking. So these are relationships that continue to go on. On this trip in the Amazon, there were some really, really cool excursions that um, I don't think could have been, even happen anywhere in the world today. Um, our family's favorite was what was called the fish hike. And if you can imagine getting off of a boat and having people hand you two life preservers, one they said, put on like a diaper. And the other one they said, put on like the regular way. And they said, now you're just going to float down the river. So it was a tributary near the Amazon, and they said, don't stop because there could be piranhas. Just keep going. And so, <laughs> so my boys love that story, and we had a great time. Another thing we did on this particular trip was we, uh, we I did not, but the, the younger people and the student leaders, travel, they climbed up like way up high, 10 stories high, so they could be above the canopy to see what the animals were experiencing, the birds, and what was up there, so they could understand that this was a place that was bigger than all of us. And then, of course, a wind and rainstorm happened, and so they were stuck up there for um, a lengthy amount of time, but it, it gave them something really fun to talk about. Um, the other thing about this trip that made it so important and, and special for us is there's this continued correspondence 20 years later from the travelers that we were on this trip with. So holiday cards, letters, what we're doing. And, and for those of us who are local, we have the benefit of running into each other in, in group in outings like this at Stanford and even on other trips. So some of you in this room, I've traveled with you multiple times just by coincidence because we're a self-selected group of adventure travelers. So um, for each of us, it gives us an ability to speak with faculty in a very comfortable way, to not be intimidated and for, for 
young people, the students as well as my younger students, it, it just was a really great thing to, to experience that. So I'm going to talk a little bit just briefly about some of these other trips. Um, as Leslie told you, the Costa Rica trip was a family adventure. Super fun for families. A lot more kids, a lot more chaos. Um, we were slogging through mud, you know, sliding down, um, yeah, sleeping in tree houses, hiking around a volcano in a cloud forest, you know, seeing poison dart frogs. It was everything that you could imagine that kids would love. And for us as adults, we also enjoyed the companionship of the parents who were leading their children there to this trip. Um, the Galapagos, I loved that trip so much I went twice. Um, I, the second time I went, I took my ninth grader, my then ninth grader, because he was going to be studying Dar uh, Darwin that year. And the Stanford students he encountered, just like the ones on the, the previous trip from the Amazon, were such incredible role models in these presentations that they gave nightly before our dinner, so that um, Chris had never seen a PowerPoint presentation. So the technology upgraded. So in, in the Amazon in 1997, we were using um, overhead projectors. But now we were up to PowerPoint uh, for the Galapagos trip. So all he knew as, as a standard was what these college students were doing. So when it was time for his presentation, he, he um, used the model for these, from these students to create his own presentation, which was really quite spectacular with the help of of Bill and some of the other people there. Um, so I'm really excited to talk about the, the Great Barrier Reef and the Seychelles because Joel Simon is also here and he was our trip leader. And um, what I wanted to say, I think about these trips, it's so important is if you're lucky, I mean, I, I feel like all of the trips I was lucky, but you have a great leader like Bill, like Joel, and you start to follow these people because they're so engaging and they attract great people. So I'm fortunate to have been on that trip twice, um, uh, traveled twice with Joel as well as, as with Bill. And the Seychelles trip, I went with my um, in-laws and my college roommate. And we had such a great, great time. This was diving and snorkeling. But what happened after that trip is like this travel planner that you probably all have at, your, at home so that the Seychelles trip was in about 2008. After that trip, every time this brochure comes out, I call my former roommate who's in, in uh, New York and I say, hey, get your travel, travel booklet out. And we just go page by page drinking coffee from our coasts saying, which trip shall we do next? And we haven't been able to travel together since, but each of us has taken trips uh, separately. Um, with Stanford as a result of the travel study trip. But what I find is it's, it's such great imagination for us. It's just very inspiring to figure out how, how to travel. So um, one other trip I want to talk about is the most recent one that I took, which was to Cuba. And I'm really happy that Emily is in the audience because this trip was um, with the black alumni at Stanford. It was our first trip. And Emily Casperson from the Alumni Association and Don Sher, who's a professor from Puget Sound, actually led this trip. And they knew that our interest was to understand what the um, Afro-Cuban experience was, and they really brought it to life. We had a person-to-person -person visas, so it meant that we took a deep dive into all things cultural and people. We met doctors, we met journalists, we had students, musicians, artists, and everybody gave us their attention and talked to us specifically about their experiences. And, and what, what I also want to point out about that trip in particular was, and, and it's true of the other trips as well, there was a mutual exchange of information. So we tend to think we're going on these trips to learn about other people. But the Cubans that we met were just as excited to meet Americans, particularly black Americans who cared enough to spend money and take a trip to get to know them. And they were equally curious about our, cute, our culture as we were about theirs. So I will never forget that trip as well. So um, before I end up, I wanna just tie this all together and I'm gonna go back to the Amazon. So these are my notes, so just ignore. This is literally how I brainstorm. So if there are typos, I apologize. But when I was thinking about pulling this together, I thought, wow, what, what happened? How can I describe the impact that this trip in 1997 had on my life 20 years ago? And I'm not gonna talk about everything because some of it I already talked about, but it led to seven more amazing Stanford trips. And um, 
my family started an ecotourism business in 2000, where Bill Durham and Constanzo Campo, who were the two people who led us on this amazing Amazon journey, were very instrumental in setting that ecotourism business up. We have lifelong relationship with some amazing people. We cross travels all the time. And, um, and a, special, <laughs> a special interest of mine was hiking that Inca Trail in 2008 with my family and some other families from Brazil. And we did that because when we were with Bill in, in Cusco and Machu Picchu, he said, you know, you don't have to take the train. You actually can hike this. It takes five days. And it took us about 10 years to get up the energy and the nerve to do it, but we did do it. So I just want to say that for me, the importance of travel is that um, these trips epitomize everything that is important to me. And um, I just believe to my core that travel is transformative. It connects us with people, with nature, with culture. It helps us find our tribe in the most likely of, um, the most unlikely of situations. And sta traveling with Stanford has taught me to be a much better traveler, a better human, a better citizen of the world. So thank you, Brett for running this amazing program. Thank you, Bill, for all you've done. Leslie, thank you for making this talk possible. And thank you all for being here and for your interest in supporting Stanford Travel Study. And that is it. Good evening. It's an honor to be with you today and to celebrate 50 years of travel study. I'm grateful to fellow speakers Brett, Leslie, and Cindy for this opportunity. I'm here to reflect specifically on what travel study has done for and with the Stanford faculty. What I'll ask you folks in the audience to do is this. Please remember that I am but one of roughly 50 professors who lead travel study trips every year. So the challenge for you is to multiply my few points and examples by 50 so that you can really appreciate travel studies impact on faculty. This evening I'd like to make just four points. Number one, when you've taught a few thousand teenagers, you realize what a joy it is to work with real adults. <laughs> you alums are not on a trip because it's required of you. You don't do the reading because it might be covered on the exam. You do these things because of your commitment to lifelong learning. You use your vacation time and your vacation budget to learn new things through travel. Now there's something that really inspires us faculty. And that's not even to mention the many concrete things we learn back from you while traveling. The photography trip tips, for example, that faculty pick up from alums. Joel Simon, for example, is still helping me with photography. Or insights from your profession or your other travels or investment options that you know so much better than we do. All these things and more from alums are travel study benefits for faculty, but the best of all, travel study has meant for faculty the chance to form lasting relationships with interesting and talented people from all walks of life. Let me give you just a couple examples from the dozens that I could cite. Cindy's already given the lovely example of our ongoing relationship from their family traveling with us, traveling with my classes to Galapagos and the Amazon. Consider also the case of the young director of freshman admissions in 1967, John Bennell, who admitted me as a student to the Stanford class of 1971. How wonderful to reconnect with John many years later on travel study trips to Africa, the Galapagos, and Patagonia. Had it not been for John, at least one of us wouldn't be here today. <laughs> or Elizabeth Warren and John Working, who shared travel study experiences in South America and then graciously lent me when I really needed it, a quiet place to hide out and work on my book about Galapagos. 
Yes, Elizabeth, it's done. She's been eager for me to finish, and I'm too much of a perfectionist to hurry. It's called Exuberant Life, and it should be out in a year. Or here's a fun example. My own sophomore year roommate, Dave Siegfried, still crazy after all these years, he and I reconnected on a series of travel study trips. Imagine the stories we can tell about our time together at Stanford in France in 1969. Ooh la la. Or Bob Chandler and Bonnie Wollstonecroft, who helped me with my senior honors project way back when we were all students. I could go on and on, but the point is what meaningful, lasting relationships we faculty form and reform with alumni and friends in the course of travel study adventures. These are very meaningful to us. Number two, here's a second thing that faculty appreciate about travel study. We're invited to go to new places and experience new societies, new ecosystems, new natural wonders. It's all well organized, comfortable, and classy. It's not at all like our own field work. When you do a lot of field work for your career, like many on the faculty, including myself, you realize what bliss it is to travel with Stanford compared to Stanford travel study with what we have to do on our own like travel in some crummy old broken down station wagon with a backpack and dirty jeans, lots of peanut butter sandwiches, driving for days to out of the way places over terrible roads, that's what our field work is like. But now with travel study, faculty get to go in style in an air conditioned bus that someone else drives. The rice at lunch is not left over from two days ago. The light bulbs all work in the hotel room and there is someone to keep track of your luggage. Now, what's not to like about that? With travel study, we faculty to get to go, we get to go to new places in enjoyable ways. We get to go with other interested adults, and we get to go with talented professionals like Leslie, Brett, Karen, Emily, Ann, and their colleagues. Often, our travel study colleagues will ask for our ideas and insights in a collaborative form of trip planning that helps everyone to get more from the experience. And sometimes travel study takes us right back to our own favorite field sites, but takes us in a new way. As you figured out, I love to travel with Stanford to Galapagos. And then we faculty get to try out our new ideas and our theories on an interested audience. A number of you, I'll embarrass a few, Bert and Dee Dee McMurtry, Don and Margaret Ann Fiddler, Tom and Sharon Kelly, have patiently listened in this way to so many of my own crazy ideas like my argument to explain the unusual forests of giant daisies in Galapagos. Imagine the fun it is for faculty to travel in style and to have you for an audience. Yes, for all of this old and new, we faculty are grateful for travel study. Number three, a third thing faculty like is what travel study expeditions have done and do for our teaching. During most of my career, for example, I've taught a lot about Charles Darwin, and I've gotten to know his life's work reasonably well. I've seen the mockingbirds that so influenced his thinking. I've been to Down House and walked the sand walk where he worked out so many of his enduring ideas. But when Brett gave me the chance in 2009 in the bicentennial celebration of Darwin's birth to replicate the voyage of the Beagle by private jet with Stanford Travel Study, what I understood about Darwin would leap to a whole new level of insight and depth. Just to give you a few examples, to collect fossils on the very cliffs near Montevideo where Darwin did, and to reread and marvel at what he concluded from those fossils. To find Darwin's fungus, Ceteria darwini, as he did on the beech trees of Tierra del Fuego, and to taste it myself as Darwin observed native Fuegians to do. You can make a delicious salad from the stuff. To see marine iguanas, the imps of darkness, swimming their way through the surf to feed on algal mats on the floor of the sea while their land iguana cousins are eating cactus pads on desert islands. To ponder the formation of coral atolls and lagoons in mid-Pacific islands as Darwin did, and then use his observations to disprove the arguments of atoll formation by then famous senior geologist Charles Lyell. Wow, these things still give me goosebumps. Experiential learning has added to my appreciation of all that Darwin did, but it added so much to my own teaching and writing about these topics. When you stop to think about it, 
Many classes at Stanford are better, more carefully illustrated, and more exciting for students because of faculty trips with, with travel study. It's a well-kept secret. Travel study gives faculty new material for class. The last of my four points might be the most surprising, and that has to do with undergraduate and graduate students who themselves are direct beneficiaries of travel study in ways that are not widely known. My point is that travel studies impact reaches deep into the regular academic program at Stanford. One way it does so, you probably already know. Today we celebrate 50 years of the travel study program, but we also celebrate 25 years of travel study field seminars. Yes, 25 years ago now, with the help of Duncan Beardsley and the support of Lynn Kelson and others, some of us faculty persuaded travel study to allow us to bring undergraduates along with alumni on travel study trips, as Cindy and Brett referred to. In the early days, this dream came true with a wonderful seed grant from Peter and Helen Bing, who have done so very much for all of us at Stanford. But did you know that just when the seed grant from the Bings ran out, some alums and friends stepped in to help, like many of you in this room, like Rob and Rosemary Hess, like Cindy Fry and John Gunn, and more, and created an endowment that allows 14 sophomores and two TAs to join at least one travel study trip every year in perpetuity at no cost to themselves. The Field Seminar Endowment Fund has to count as one of the truly great contributions of travel study to the normal academic program of the university. The students all take these courses for credit. But there's another wonderful student program that is less well known, unless you happen to be a student. Back in 1997, Stanford alumni Bill Crandall Sr. and Janet Ford Crandall of San Mateo were travelers on a travel study field seminar to Galapagos when they came up to me on the railing of the ship. They talked about what an inspiration it was for them to see 14 students, mostly aged 19 to 22, exploring in Galapagos, hunting in tide pools, walking along the beach, taking photographs, and they reminded me that Darwin was only 26 for his historic visit to the islands. It's easy to forget that Darwin was just out of college when the Beagle set sail. The Crandall said something like, wouldn't it be wonderful if Stanford had a program to give Stanford students the equivalent of Darwin's Beagle voyage? A genuine adventure of discovery of their own design and initiative anywhere in the world. I said, yes, it would indeed be terrific. All the more so because Stanford students, you may not know, are not eligible for these wonderful Thomas J. Watson fellowships for purposeful independent exploration outside the United States. You have to be from a small liberal arts college. To make a long story short, excited by their experience with undergrads on a travel study field seminar, Bill and Jan Crandall went on to establish a special endowment for student explorations that's now in its 20th year on campus. It has sent roughly 100 Stanford students on Darwin-like adventures all over the planet. To live in Maasai villages, to dance with whirling dervishes, to study biomimicry in European architecture, to follow lemurs in Madagascar, to study the effects of aging in rural China, to voyage with Polynesian voyagers and navigation teams, to figure out speciation of fishes in the Rift Valley of Africa, and so much more. Bill Crandall Sr., who I'm sorry to say has since passed away, came up with a name for this special light, uh, opportunity. He named them the Beagle II Awards. And can you imagine their special appeal to undergraduates? Wow, you mean like Darwin? Is an expression I often hear. Just this week, 24 applications came in for this summer's Beagle II Awards administered by undergraduate advising and research. I'm very pleased that Bill Crandall Jr. could be with us today to celebrate 20 years of the Beagle II Awards, which came into existence because of his parents and travel study. So now you know that one of the most prestigious student awards on campus came about because of alumni and travel study. So if you've kept your part of the deal and have multiplied my personal few examples and stories 
by 50, I would say you now have a pretty good idea of the amazing impact that travel study continues to have on Stanford faculty. In conclusion, I would say that leading Stanford trips is among the top awards that faculty receive for their dedicated efforts in research and teaching. Not every faculty gets asked to do this. Don't call us, we'll call you. And because of you alumni, it is better and more rewarding than any plaque or certificate we might put on our walls. So I say thank you to Travel Study, and I say thank you to you Stanford alumni. Wow, this sounds like a really great program. <laughs> so we start out by telling you about the beginning, um, and then we had some wonderful um, perspective from our travelers and our faculty. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to, um, once again, thank all of the people who, are who have been involved in the five decades of travel study. There's too many people to mention, my former um, predecessors as directors, you know, all of our faculty, um, people have been on so many trips, um, it's just amazing. And we are so grateful, those of us who work in the office and who are part of Travel Study, to work with you and have the most incredible job on campus. However, the story of Travel Study is not over. Um, it continues, and it continues with 2018. So I'd like to share with you what we're planning for this year and beyond. So for 2018, we are reprising in honor of the 50th anniversary, the very first travel study trip as I mentioned, that I mentioned before, the Rhine River College. So we are doing exactly the same thing, although we have reimagined it for families this time. We have redesigned it uh, with the yells and all the wonderful interaction um, that Cindy mentioned. We are also looking at, as, as you know, the world is getting to be a smaller place and there are fewer places that others have not been. However, I have a couple up my sleeve. However, what we are concentrating on now is taking people to places that they may have been but seeing it in a different way and also to providing experiences that would be very difficult to do on your own, if at all. So this is a trip we're doing to Churchill in Canada to see the polar bears. So you may have heard about you know, there are plenty of trips that go to Churchill to see the polar bears, and then you drive out two hours or three hours to go see the polar bears. We are taking over these tundra buggies and turning them into a lodge. So you're going to be looking out your window as you eat dinner while the polar bears are looking hungrily back at you. <laughs> but it's up close and personal. That is the theme. We're also getting up close and personal with humpback whales in Tonga. This is a picture taken by Emily, I think, uh, on a scouting trip where she went out and swam with the humpback whales. You can get pretty close, 30 meters. You know, that's probably closer than I'd like to be, but it is an amazing, spectacular experience. So those are the kinds of experiences and um, trips that we're working on. And I mentioned that I have a couple places up my sleeve that are pretty off the beaten track. This is one of them. We have Scott and Sandra Pearson going with us to Sudan. So people would tell me, why are you going to Sudan? You must be crazy to be going to Sudan. And I said, well, maybe I am, so I'll have to go and check it out. So I did. And I went to Sudan, and what I found was amazing. There are no tourists there. Um, <laughs> you don't sound like you're surprised. <laughs> um, but it also felt very safe. And so we do our due diligence. Security is the number one concern for us, and I spent a very large portion of my time working on that. And so we researched it thoroughly. I went, I saw it, I was on the ground, I walked around these very ruins, and the only people I ran into were archeologists. That's the kind of experience that you don't see very often now in crowded uh, Europe or in Egypt. But these pyramids are amazing. There are fields with or planes with 300 pyramids. It's an amazing, spectacular site. So we're going to do that. We're going to do that. Um, also, since Peter had the brilliant idea of going to the North Pole, I had the some might 
some might say not quite so brilliant, but equally deranged idea of going to the South Pole. So in 2018, 2019, we are doing an expedition to the South Pole, not just Antarctica. Uh, we have been doing Antarctica cruises for a long time, but in this particular trip, we are going to the South Pole and we are skiing the last degree of latitude. So what you do is you fly in from Punta Arenas into Union Glacier. We do some staging there and then you fly to the 89th parallel and cross country ski, pulling a 75 pound sled for eight days in minus 25 degrees. And since we're doing it in January, it will be daylight all the time. Sounds balmy. Um, and then we will uh, end up at the Amundsen Scott South Pole Station. So this is a, you know, it's quite an undertaking. So we have two training camps ahead of time. We have a high altitude camp uh, because you know, I didn't realize this until I started looking into this trip, and we've been working on it for five years already, um, is that the South Pole, because of the curvature of the Earth and the thinning of the atmosphere at the poles, it feels higher than it actually is, but it has an effective altitude of 9,000 feet. So we have a high altitude camp, and then we have a winter camp in northern Minnesota where we're going to do um, winter training, you know, in very cold conditions to prepare us. So this is an epic trip. I think, well, these are the tents, well in keeping with the tradition of travel study, of charting new horizons, pushing the envelope, being innovative, educational, um, and excellent. This is our website. We have a whole website on the 50th anniversary. We have a lot more information there on the very first trip, the Mississippi trips, the Danube, our trips to uh, Egypt and elsewhere, and our uh, field seminars, family trips, that sort of thing. It's a wonderful resource. Um, I recommend that you check it out. Um, and then I'd like to talk a little bit about what travel study means to us in the office and those of us who have worked there. So there are, we did a little search, we checked all the we counted up the number of people who have ever worked in travel study, and there are over 90. A lot of us have spent our, the, vast, the majority of our careers in travel study. And the reason we do it is we, because we know from our own experience and through the um, testimony of others like Cindy and Bill about how travel changes people's lives. You know, sometimes it's obvious, sometimes it's not. When you go to Iran and you have school kids on field trips coming up to you at Persepolis and wanting to take selfies with you, or when you have parents thrusting their small children into your arms so they could take a picture of you too, and they say they love America, they love Americans, that's a different perspective than one would get on the nightly news. You know, that changes your perspective. Um, and when you bring faculty into the picture who are able to set things in a much larger context, be it historical or economic or political or global, that augments the impact of the change that, that travel can have on people. And we think it's important. So there are subtle, subtle signs that, that travel affects change. And sometimes, once in a while, you get someone who will tell you a very direct substantive change. And I'd like to share with you a comment we got from a traveler who is a recent alum. He was on a trip with his parents. We call them family seminars to Cuba. These are trips for parents and their adult children. And I'll just read to you what he said. The Stanford Travel Study Program is an amazing program and the best way to see the world. If it were not for my experiences traveling to Tanzania in 2007 with a Stanford Travel Study family adventure, I do not think I would have been accepted into Stanford. That trip and Dr. Bob Siegel's lectures changed the way I looked at public health, global inequity, and humanitarian efforts, which shaped the extracurricular activities I did in high school and even inspired my application essays for colleges. 
I studied human biology and minored in Swahili at Stanford because of those weeks in the Serengeti with travel study. I cannot yet say the lasting impressions this trip to Cuba has left, although I can say that I've been checking Stanford job postings for an opening in the travel study department every day since. <laughs> Not uncommon. So travel matters. Stanford travel study, travel matters. Thank you.